This meeting will come to order. This is a regular session of the Bloomington Common Council for Wednesday, the 17th of June, 2020. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Rollo? Here. Scambleri? Here. Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Sims? Here. Bolin? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Flaherty? Here. Smith? Here. Sandberg? I think she's still on her way in, but uh, okay, well, we have a quorum. Uh, this is a summation of the agenda for this evening. We will hear approval of minutes. Actually, we have no minutes for approval. We'll go to reports from council members followed by from the mayor and city offices, from council committees and from members of the public. That will be a 20 minute period for comment. We will have appointments to boards and commissions followed by legislation for a second reading and resolutions, which include Ordinance 2011, an ordinance recommending that portions of the Bloomington Municipal Code be temporarily suspended due to the ongoing public health emergency. Uh, and Resolution 2009, authorizing the allocation of the Jack Hopkins Social Service Program funds for the year 2020 and related matters. There is no legislation for first reading. We will have a second period of public comment, 25 minutes for items not on the agenda. Uh, we will hear matters of council schedule and we will adjourn for what will be a long look forward to council recess. With that, let's go to reports from council members. I'm going to start with the person who has uh, last on my screen, uh, council member Sandberg. I'm, so, I'm glad to see you made it back in. Yes, uh, I am back. If you have a report, um, please go ahead. I, I do not. Thank you. All right. Council member Rollo. Uh, you're muted. I am. No, I'm not. Thank you. Okay. Uh, two brief items. One is uh, I wish to go on record uh, in supporting uh, Randy Paul's suggestion or request uh, some weeks back to continue Zooming uh, our, our meetings for the public, particularly those who have physical challenges. Uh, I think it is an excellent idea. Uh, despite some concerns of security uh, and disruption, I think those can be overcome. And uh, I hope we can do this, uh, maintain Zooming when this body assembles in place again in the council chambers. Uh, my second comment is just a general comment to say that I'm quite distressed. I think a number, a lot of people are, uh, according to polls, for our country. Uh, hoping that we will address challenges, uh, particularly regarding race and inequality, including uh, the grotesque economic disparities that exist in our, in our country. What makes me worried is that we have uh, a very polarized country, uh, and this is made worse by various media that caters to the polarities, and probably uh, made worse by social media and results in uh, echo chambers that it creates. But I think this conversation is very much needed. I fear that if it doesn't occur and we can't come to uh, agreement, uh, then violence will probably continue. And I would suggest that this conversation needs to be based on objectivity, needs to be based on the ability for people to speak without being bullied. Uh, it needs to be based upon statistical data and other types of data that we can we can all agree on and to move forward on public policy that works in in everyone's interest so that concludes my comment thank you thank you council member smith i have no comment thank you uh council member flaherty no report tonight thank you council member rosenberger no report, thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Sims. Thank you, I had to unmute, unmute myself. Um, I have a couple of brief comments. Um, first, I'd like to join my colleague, Council Member Rallo, uh, with regard to um, maintaining 
virtual uh, platforms for meeting um, Zoom as we move forward um, for the reasons that he stated. But I would also like to, to throw my hat in there that, and many of us have talked about this, to keep the ASL people, the American Sign Language people, um, in order to translate in that regard. Um, and I hope we can work that out and make that so, um, even in virtual meetings. Um, the second brief comment is um, just something I would like for the public to think about, and many of us have been thinking a lot about um, our social situation. But uh, another thought for the, for the folks out there and for my colleagues, if in fact we can view a police officer kneeling on a man's neck in broad daylight to the point of death, I want everyone to think about what could possibly be happening across in America in our human resources offices, in our hospitals, in our doctor's offices, in our classrooms, in our banks. Uh, there are many other um, areas that we can have this discussion. Obviously, uh, we're going to start at least in this area with local law enforcement, which is a segue, but I'd like everyone to think about um, those other examples that I just gave. Uh, lastly, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., the City Council's Public Safety Standing Committee will have a hearing, um, starts at seven o'clock. Um, we are hoping for it to last for a couple hours and get as much public comments um, that we can. I would like to mention that on those standing committees are, are my colleagues, Council Member Susan Sandberg, Council Member Sue Scambolari, and Council Member Isabel Piedmont-Smith, um, formidable group that I'm proud to be working with. Now, our meeting tomorrow night, we, our only intent is to receive information from the public. Um, I hope there's been a little bit of misinformation, so I hope no one is expecting, as I've seen before, a robust dialogue. Um, that will not occur, at least tomorrow. We will have it in the future, but I don't think tomorrow. There will not be a question and answer period. Um, we just simply want to receive and hear what the public thinks uh, with regard to local law enforcement. And we have not invited any city staff um, to join us. So we want to keep this as generic as we can in order to get information from the public. And I want everyone to understand that once we compile that and analyze it a little bit or transcribe it as a better word, it is our hope that we can use this information as a basis for considering or possibly making changes in the future moving forward. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow when we start. But those are my comments for the evening and thanks for asking, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Scambaluri. I have no report this evening, thank you. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, I just wanted to um, remind the public that Black Lives Matter Bloomington is having a Juneteenth celebration um, on Friday, June 19th. Juneteenth is actually tomorrow, but June 19th at Reverend Butler Park from 4 to 8 p.m. with all social distancing and um, mask requirements, recommendations uh, of the CDC in place. Um, and you can find out more about that. And they do ask that you register so they can have enough uh, food and masks available um, at um, uh, Black Lives Matter Bloomington on Facebook. So if you just search Black Lives Matter Bloomington, You'll see their Juneteenth celebration. It should be some some great artists and speakers involved. So um, hope to see some of you there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, the nineteenth is a Friday. Yes. Um, Friday. You said that it was. Is the event tomorrow or Friday? It's Friday. Okay. Thank you. But Juneteenth right. is actually on the eighteenth, but their event is going to be. I thought the it was 19th. the nineteenth. Okay. Yeah. My bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to echo Councilor Sims announcement. I want to thank the Public Safety Committee for uh, beginning the process of taking up the complicated issue of policing tomorrow night. And I want to urge everyone to attend. Uh, we do go on recess after this meeting tonight, although there will be committee meetings such as public safety and such through the recess. But our next regular session will not be until July 22nd. 
um, it is my intent that we find a way to integrate Zoom or the equivalent meeting protocol, a remote meeting protocol into our meeting procedures uh, as soon as we can after recess. Um, questions of accessibility such as Zoom, ASL, um, have already begun. We've already been discussing those items internally between leadership and council staff. We are actively looking for ways to make the, to keep the council as accessible as it has been and to make it as accessible as possible. So if uh, anyone has uh, thoughts on those issues, uh, we welcome them. I certainly do. Please send, email volans at bloomington.in.gov. Um, so with that, we now go to reports from the mayor and city offices. I see Mayor John Hamilton is here. Mr. Mayor, would you like to uh, take it away? Thanks very much. It's good to see you all. Uh, I'll try to blast through a few things tonight um, and then hand it off to Beverly Calendar Anderson, who's going to provide an update on the social services working group. Uh, first, some updates on the COVID-related, coronavirus-related issues. You all know the county health uh, department ordered last uh, Friday that we would shift into stage four, basically, uh, the state's established stages. Uh, that means, according to that order, bars are allowed to open now uh, as of Friday, up to 50% capacity. Playgrounds, courts, uh, sports leagues allowed to function. Restaurants back to 75% capacity. Retail stores 100%. Uh, we did, from the county, they did choose to keep the social gathering level uh, below 100 people or fewer uh, as what's approved for private social gatherings. Um, we have had a recent modest bump in cases and fatalities in the county. Um, it is important to note that the county death rate is still about one half of that of the state uh, average uh, as well as the national average, but I am still very concerned um, and in particular we have uh, the big fact of thousands and thousands tens of thousands of students likely to come back in august um, as they come back from around the country and the world um, we're going to need to be very vigilant i want to let you know that there is discussion going on about potentially um, particular rules or uh, approaches that may be different from what we have right now kind of for that August to November period when we're going to have a fairly different kind of uh, environment for the disease and for our community. So we will be um, in more, more in touch on that as we look at those possibilities. Um, effective Monday, uh, this coming Monday, uh, the city is going to implement a mandatory mask policy for all of our employees. We've had a very strongly encouraged policy and provided free masks and had a lot of compliance, but not 100% compliance. And we've decided uh, with all the exhortations, we really need to move to a mandatory policy for all of our employees whenever they are within six feet of each other or the public uh, or may likely be that way, we'll be providing those masks and that will be effective starting Monday. Just so you know, our parks department did extraordinary yeoman's work to get all the playgrounds sanitized, cleaned to a couple dozen playgrounds and fitness stations uh, in record time for Friday opening. There are public restrooms now open since Monday uh, at three parks, Alcott, Bryan, and Lower Cascades, uh, 13 hours a day. Uh, we plan to open two more uh, public restrooms in Building and Trades and Butler Park at stage five. Those have been a little more difficult. Uh, we don't have the staffing to cover those that we do in the other three parks to continue to sanitize those uh, throughout the day like we will in the currently open restrooms. Um, let me turn just to some very other brief updates before I hand it over to, um, to Beverly uh, Calendar Anderson. Uh, just very quick updates on a few items. One, the Waldron, um, we have asked a internal team, an internal team to focus on some short-term questions and opportunities, short-term meaning kind of the next 12 months probably-ish, uh, to identify uh, what it means to have that building back, what kind of uses it might be uh, offered for, used for over the next uh, six, 12 months. Uh, we appreciate Council Member Sandberg serving on that internal team at your direction uh, to just kind of identify in the short term what we can do. 
Uh, I would expect that in a few months, in a few weeks or months, we will ask a longer term group, com community focused group, community based group, to really help analyze the longer term uses of that building, uh, which we expect to come into possession, uh, repossession of in, in August, um, and thinking more broadly, longer term, uh, what's the right use of that. So just wanted to let you know that, and of course, take questions on all these. A quick convention center update. You all know uh, the revenues in food and beverage have been dramatically declining uh, in, in since the closures uh, up to half uh, cut. Uh, and of course, the convention industry is upside down right now. So uh, collaborating with our county colleagues and you and all, we, we expect to kind of take a pause on any activities related to planning uh, for that convention center until the end of the year. And we'll come back to revisit, look at revenue, look at uh, the industry and such, but just wanted to let you and the public know we'll take a six or six or seven month uh, break uh, on that. Uh, right up the street from that, the hospital reuse uh, committee met last night uh, with a public session. Uh, about 200 people joined that uh, with dozens of questions asked uh, and answered, uh, including online. Uh, that is a big conversation that has begun about that, uh, that location. I would encourage anybody interested in that, go to Bloomington Hospital site, all one word, S-I-T-E at the end there, dot com uh, to look at the um, tons of material. Please give feedback on that. Um, a similar big conversation is starting tomorrow night about the seven line. That was one of the four major trails uh, invested and funded through the Bicentennial Bond that we did in 2018. That seven line, the uh, plan for a uh, protected bike lane, enhanced bus service, enhanced um, pedestrian access from the B line east on 7th Street all the way to campus at Woodlawn and eventually a couple miles farther than that all the way to the far east side of town. Uh, that begins with a public uh, meeting tomorrow night uh, as well. I think that's at six o'clock um, and please jump online with that too on the city. I want to thank the council for your consideration of the signage changes to help our uh, retail businesses in particular uh, pick back up and get where they're going and the exciting Kirkwood pilot project this weekend, which I hope many of you will enjoy. Uh, and I finally wanna uh, thank and appreciate the consideration of the, the, um, the discussion and the consideration of all of our public safety efforts. Um, Council Member Sims uh, referred to his meeting, uh, the committee meeting that will be happening tomorrow um, it is always a good thing as a community to, to review what we are doing, how we are doing in all ways, and especially around racial justice. Yes, around public safety and beyond, as Council Member Sims stated, these are key issues for all of us to welcome and, uh, and, and uh, support conversations, reviews, questions, suggestions, changes, in, and I look forward to that. Um, besides the council committee meeting tomorrow, there will be a public safety review board uh, meeting early next week. Some of you know that got uh, disrupted last evening uh, technologically, and uh, so that will take place again next week. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you to keep uh, getting our city better. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Beverly Calendar Anderson for an update, and then happy to take questions on that or any other matters. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton. Uh, I am Beverly Callender Anderson. I am the Director of Community and Family Resources Department. And I'm just gonna give you a brief update before you all leave out on your break um, of what the Social Services Working Group has been up to. So I'm gonna share my screen, I think. Okay, and so some of this is a repeat of what the uh, committee talked about two weeks ago, but I think it was about two weeks, but I will go through that part very quickly. Um, as you know, these are the members of the group. They have been a great group to work with, um, just very proactive in doing everything. And so we had John Barrett, a Diane Bazell, a Fry Pfefferman, Tina Peterson, and Dan Smith. Um, when we, we prioritize the areas of emergency food provision, an isolation shelter for persons experiencing homelessness, child care for essential workers and personal health and safety. And in the areas of, of food provision, um, we have been meeting with each of these, uh, food provision, child care and isolation shelter. We have been meeting with uh, providers of these services sometimes weekly 
um, sometimes every two weeks with the shelter, isolation shelter, we meet daily. Well, now we're down to three days a week, but we were meeting daily. Um, the Community Foundation is serving as a navigator for childcare, has been helping um, those, those essential workers who are needing childcare find the appropriate services, also has helped with some funding in that area. Um, the isolation shelter is serving a six county ar area. They have averaged about one guest a week. There was one week where there were like three guests in the shelter at one time. Um, but of in all the weeks that they, they have been open there, you've only seen two positive cases. Um, one of those uh, got through uh, COVID just fine. The other ended up going to Indianapolis to the isolation shelter in Indianapolis. And that was at the very beginning. Uh, so I think that our shelters good job with education, masking, um, face, your face coverings, uh, hand washing. So we have not had the spread that was expected. Um, our emergency food providers um, had a, a problem with the food chain um, at the beginning. Uh, they've sort of stabilized, but um, their goal is to stay at least with, with at least a two week inventory um, as we continue to move through this. With personal health and safety, we were really looking at things like mental health services, domestic violence, and some other services. And so, again, those priorities are continuing to develop. That one was a, a little more difficult to work through. Um, there has been several um, grant funds related to COVID, and these this is a list of the grant funding. Some of them are pending. They haven't quite uh, been completed. Some of them have been completed. But um, through all of these funds, there is uh, $3,247,963 and change that has been awarded or will be awarded um, direct to social service agencies to deal with um, new pro either new programming, uh, supplies needed, whatever changes they needed related to COVID-19. Um, and like I said, a couple of those are pending. Some of them are complete. Uh, but that's the amount of money from throughout, not just the city of Bloomington, but city small c. Um, so the needs that we're seeing coming up, um, I don't know how many people know, but right now Wheeler Women's Shelter is scheduled to close July 5th. Uh, it's purely a financial issue. They have been um, running a deficit for all the time that they've been here. Um, so. And in speaking to them, it's basically about $350,000 a year to keep them open. We will lose 35 to 50 women's beds if the shelter closes. They suspect that seven to 10 women will go to Indianapolis, but that also, I mean, if, if 10 go, they have 35 right now, that's 25 women that will be without shelter. Um, they hope to continue to run some of the case management through the men's shelter, but the men's shelter won't be able to take on any new women. Um, and the, um, yeah, so that, that will leave a big loss in our community for beds for women. Um, the men's shelter is current at Wheeler is currently rushing the completion of their remodel. They bought the Tri-State Bearings building um, and they, they're trying to rush that with the expectancy of uh, another COVID surge in the fall, which will allow for social distancing. They had to, this, pat, this season, this part of the phase of the pandemic, um, really use some space that should have been remodeled for a day room and they were able, but they were able to uh, use it to spread people out. And so they're hoping while their numbers are a little lower, they can finish their remodel in case there is a surge in the fall. Um, the, and we, I think we talked about two weeks ago that the isolation shelter moved to a new location um, and reduced the number of beds they had because they weren't seeing as many guests as expected. So hopefully the cost savings of that move will allow them um, to stay open through the fall in case there is a second surge in COVID. And I want to mention in the shelter area, although this is not a shelter, many of you know that um, Shalom closed um, for a while to having anyone in their shelter because they 
um, didn't have the space. And so they have reopened at 50% capacity um, and are seeing people, but they're only seeing people who are homeless. Uh, people who are not homeless, but who come there for food only, they're serving on a carry out basis. So they're still getting food, but they're getting it on a carry out basis, but they do have the shelter open now for people to come in, but at 50% capacity. So people can come in and get their do laundry, eat, um, and the other services that they offer. In the childcare area, um, that is still being monitored. Our registrations on childcare were low because so many people were, we believe, working from home or had um, other ways to do childcare. But there is um, the suspicion that this will be a bigger issue once all the workplaces are reopened and when school begins in the fall. Right now, we don't know what the format for school opening will be. So we don't know if kids will be going five days a week, two days a week, three days a week. Um, and so um, the child care group is really monitoring that and, and working closely with MCCSC um, to, to keep tabs on that. Right now, the food supply is, is pretty stable and um, but the providers are reporting that they're continuing to see an increase over last year. So a lot of those new clients that were coming because of the pandemic who either have not gone back to work or whose hours have not gotten back up to their regular um, um, hour, hours that they worked um, are still getting food through the emergency food supply providers. And so they're still seeing that increase, but right now they say they're pretty stable things are being delivered on time and that kind of thing. Um, in personal health and safety, um, just wanted to report that the Better Day Club is permanently closing. That is a, it's really an effect of COVID. Better Day Club was a day center for people experiencing dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, they did a wonderful job in this community, but most of the people that they saw were much older, very high risk. And so they closed during COVID and it just doesn't look like they will be able to reopen. And so, well, not that it doesn't look like they won't be able to reopen. Um, the other piece of this is um, that we looked at, which would be an emerging need would be technology. And thinking about if a lot of class work is being done uh, remotely, if they're doing distance learning, just making sure that all children have not only the equipment, but also the services to access um, their, their lessons. And so I know that at least MCCSC provides iPads, I, and I could not find out if that's to every student or if that's one per family. So that I don't know. But um, they do provide iPads to students, but if a family doesn't have internet services, then that becomes an issue. And so that's another issue that, that we're looking to try and resolve. Um, the, work for the, the work group in the future, they are pursuing the creation of a funders collaborative. And this is, this is strictly funders that will meet uh, probably quarterly to start to discuss priorities and initiatives and to also get agencies informed about upcoming funding opportunities. And that will be something that would be ongoing. Um, and they will continue to meet with the shelter, child care, and emergency food service providers and monitor ongoing needs. And one of the things that the group wanted me to say to council members was to thank you um, so much for your support and, and, and um, thank you for anything, you know, all of your, just support to the agency, support to them for your time um, at the meeting a couple of weeks ago to explain all that had been done. So, and personally, I thank you as well. And that's the end of my report, unless you have questions. Thank you, Ms. Callender Anderson. Uh, are there questions for either the mayor or the director of community and family resources from council members? Please let me know. Council member Sims. Thank you. Um, and this may not be uh, Ms. Callender Anderson's specific area, um, but hearing this report, what I was thinking about, I've heard, uh, I'm not in town, but I've heard that the mask making process in Banneker is coming to an end. Um, and of course, I'm very appreciative of all the uh, work and, and masks that they provided. But does anyone know how we are set, or more specifically, how IU is set up 
with mass supplies for when students return? Um, I know it might be a little bit early, but um, has, has that been part of the discussion? It's not been part of any discussion I've had, uh, Council Member Sims. Um, yeah, I don't, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I can add a little bit. Uh, first, uh, the volunteer mask makers, because Banneker is now being uh, used for additional services in the summer, we found another place for them to go. I think even yet today, uh, that group, because well, I think IU is in good shape uh, from what they report for their own needs for masks. The IU Health uh, and others who are using the surgical masks are really supportive of these homemade masks continuing to be offered to the community. So that group of volunteer heroic mask makers will be relocating to another place. Uh, I'm not sure I can announce where yet, but uh, so they're gonna keep going because people feel like that will be very helpful to the community. Thank you. Any further questions from members? Councilmember Scambaluri. Um, yes, thank you. Um, Ms. Callender Anderson, I, I'm especially excited to hear about the notion of a funders collaborative. Um, there's a finite amount of money and the more we can coordinate, I think the more we can stretch it. So thank you for that. Who is likely to be part of that? I'm assuming Jack Hopkins, United Way, so, yeah, so um, right now, I think it's all, all the folks that were on um, this team for sure, but the city, um, so the city, whether it's Jack Hopkins, CDBG, uh, whatever those, those funding sources are, uh, United Way, IU Health Foundation, Hospital Foundation, uh, I may have said United Way Community Foundation, yeah. Great, thank you. That's You're great. welcome, thank you. Councilmember Rollo is. Uh, further questions from members? Rollo. Councilmember Rollo. Councilmember Rollo. And Pete Mon Smith afterwards. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Beverly, I, regarding the Wheeler Women's Shelter. Yes. Are, are those beds currently all occupied? And I'm, I'm trying to get an idea of how, ma how many women will be in need. And then if other than those going to Indies, do you know where the, they're clients may may go as of today they have 35 beds that are occupied uh, they estimate that 10 maybe 12 might go to Indy um, if we say 10 that'll leave 25 that makes the math easy um, I, and we don't know where they will go there's a there is a possibility that they can go to New Hope services for families but New Hope has had a waiting list throughout the pandemic and so they would be put on a waiting list um, if there is a domestic violence factor in there, they may be able to go to middle way, but both of those are iffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's distressing. Um, yes, very much so. The, potentially people have no recourse but be on the street. Um, okay, uh, I had another question for the mayor, may I? Go ahead, please. Uh, Mayor Hamilton, I, I just wondered about the 7th Street Trail project. Um, have residents and businesses been notified of the meeting who are going to be affected by that project? Yes, we've, had, uh, we've had direct notice uh, to uh, residents and businesses along the area. In fact, done a number of meetings individually with some of them already. Uh, okay. This is beginning the wider public engagement of that. They'll certainly be welcome to be part of that too, but they've been contacted directly, anybody along that route. All right, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Thank you, Councilmember Council Piedmont-Smith. I was going to ask the same questions about the Wheeler Women's Shelter that Councilmember Rollo asked. So um, okay. I guess I can just ask one more wishful thinking question, are there any solutions being investigated or any possibilities? So, they, I mean, we're looking, um, but Wheeler has, Wheeler has not found any yet. And so I have said to them that, you know, I will try to help and see if I can find some funding sources for them, which I, I have been doing, but I've not been able to pull it together quite yet. So it's a matter of them continuing to pay rent at that facility or? Well, it's, it's, all, it's all of their services. So basically the men's shelter has been supporting the women's shelter 
And, and so the women's shelter has been running a deficit. And so in order to keep the men's shelter at the level where that it is now, which is probably a hundred, um, th they just had to make a decision. And that $350,000 figure that I named is for in a year. So that's salaries, that's whatever services they provide at the shelter, that's everything for you know 35 to 50 women. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions? <sighs> President Volan, are you there? Look, if uh, am I even can anybody hear me? What's happened? All right, you're back. You're all back. Uh, let's go now to members of the public. Uh, to, is there a member of the public who'd like to speak on an item not on tonight's agenda? Please raise your hand. I see two people who've raised their hand. Mr. Lucas, if you would call them off. Is there, uh, if, well, before we do that, is there only two? I see three. If we have more than four, we'll reduce the amount of time per person. Otherwise, it'll be five minutes per person. Last call for can we just People review? Ha I'm sorry. I yes, I will. I will up. be going over um, the rules for public comment here. Well, and how to um, raise one's hand in Zoom. Sorry, uh, in uh, the Zoom menu, there is a, a, a function that says raise hand. Um, I think it's different depending on what device you're using. Uh, if you cannot find it, please type into the chat, and Mr. Lucas will recognize you. So far, I see three people. Um, since seeing that, we're just going to limit it to five minutes per person. Um, people may make general comments uh, either now or at the end under reports in the public. Um, uh, you may not comment more than once uh, uh, tonight, whether it's beginning or the end of the meeting. Uh, please do state your name for the record. Um, we are going to keep audio and video disabled until public comment is called for during the rest of the meeting. Those people who wish to speak during public comment at any point during the meeting um, will uh, will have will enable audio only during that comment. Then disable audio when the comment is over. Video is going to be disabled for all speakers uh, during making public comment. With that, Mr. Lucas, who would like to speak first? I believe I saw Mr. Greg Alexander's hand go up first. They were all pretty close, so I apologize if I if I call on folks out of order, but I will uh, unmute him first, and he should be ready to comment. Mr. Alexander, you'll have five minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Greg Alexander. Uh, I just thinking about all the problems that that we face uh, with inequalities in our society. I I simply I I, I want to understand how we're going to fix. Um, disparities and how police treat people without fixing the underlying economic disparities that, that drive personal behavior. And I don't know how we're going to fix economic disparities without addressing educational disparities um, that really lie at the root of that. And I don't know how we're going to address educational disparities without addressing neighborhood segregation. And I don't know how we're going to desegregate our neighborhoods as long as neighbors are allowed to demand of the city that every house in their neighborhood is essentially of the same economic background as they are. And this is just a, a, a really hard problem because people are, are rational when they say, I don't want to live with poor people. That's a rational desire, but it's segregation. And if we, if we don't do anything about segregation in our neighborhoods and in our housing, then I simply don't see how we're going to make progress. If the only time people from different backgrounds interact with each other is through the windshield of a car while they're commuting, I simply don't know how we're going to build the kind of community and opportunities that actually make change possible. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, who's next? Next up, we've got uh, Randy Paul, who should be unmuted and ready to comment. Mr. Paul, you'll have five minutes. Please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I won't need near five minutes. Uh, this will be the last time I'll be commenting on the Zoom meetings. Uh, just to thank the council for your efforts to try to make it continue. Uh, 
I think it's going to be a huge benefit to the community, but especially those with disabilities. This is going to be a landmark kind of change for many of us to participate in government. So I appreciate everybody's efforts, and you know, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, uh, who's next, Mr. Lucas? Uh, next up is Mr. Jim Shelton, who should be unmuted and ready to go. Mr. Shelton, you'll have five minutes. Go ahead. Good evening, Council. Uh, I want to uh, agree with Mr. Paul, but I want to expand that. And I appreciate that you guys are talking about uh, somehow involving a, tel a video communication link that in into your meetings. But I want you to think about, and especially administration to think about, doing this for more than the council. Because of the, the COVID-19 and everybody being by Zoom, I've been able to participate in community on aging, uh, committee on, commission on aging meetings, the CCA transportation and mobility uh, committee where uh, Michael Sherman spotted me and grabbed me and drafted me into being uh, representing the chamber on uh, a focus group that's looking into uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles. Uh, I've been able to watch the Environmental Commission, which is not normally covered by CATS. Uh, you, I would be able to, and later to watch the MPO Technical Advisory Committee, the MPO Citizens Advisory Committee. Committee. So there are lots of opportunities to watch things that aren't covered by CATS and to participate in just about everything. So I, I think you need a broader uh, horizon than just your meetings. I certainly think yours are very important, but I think it would be something to think about to have these other meetings covered that CATS doesn't cover and to be able to participate in them. So I hope you'll think about that. Uh, I certainly agree with Mr. Paul that, that these kinds of meetings need to be accessible to people who are disabled, but they also need to be accessible to people who've got children and can't lead them or can't come, don't want to come downtown and go through the hassle of parking and get into the meeting. Same with the county meetings. This way, they don't just watch them on cats. They can actually have input. So thank you very much for, and I hope you'll think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. And that seems to conclude the uh, public commenters for this evening, first round. Uh, we have no appointments to the boards and commissions, so we will now move to legislation for second reading and resolutions. Madam Parliamentarian. Yeah, I'm mute. Did it again. Uh, Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2011 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please call the roll on the motion to introduce? Councilmember Rollo? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. Okay, uh, will the clerk please read by title and synopsis. Ordinance 2011, an ordinance recommending that portions of the Bloomington Municipal Code be temporarily suspended due to the ongoing public health emergency. And the synopsis is, this ordinance is a request from the Common Council to waive certain formalities contained in the B Bloomington Municipal Code related to signs and sidewalk eating and merchandising encroachments. The ordinance allows temporary suspension of these formalities in order to assist the local business community with its recovery following ordered closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic. These temporary measures will last until September 30th, 2020, but may be extended as needed beyond that date. Thank you. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2011 be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, is there someone from the administration here to make a presentation on this item to the full council? I see Alex Crowley. 
Yes, I'm here if I may make a quick presentation. Um, this has been reviewed by the Sustainable Development Committee, and so I wanted to summarize what we presented to them and, and open it up for questions. We'll go right ahead. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Can you see? Uh, it's coming up. Got it. Maybe others can see it, uh, but go ahead. Don't wait for All me. Right. Well, let me start before I get into the couple of slides I have here very quickly, putting this in the context of uh, the economic stabilization recovery effort that's been underway. Uh, what we're talking about are two different elements. One is easing signing, signage regulations, and the other is uh, allowing for a, Kirk a Kirkwood closure this weekend. Um, in the context of what we've been doing, we um, as you may know, have been looking at rapid response first, and we had the fund, and thank you for your support of that. We've been looking at a reopening, and this falls in the context of reopening um, uh, commercial activities in the downtown, and then, and then we also look at the longer term revitalization of Bloomington. The feedback we're getting from uh, the reopening effort, and which has been led primarily by the chamber, um, has uh, been that uh, you know any effort that we can make as a uh, city to aid that uh, would be helpful. Um, they are reopening slowly. They're doing it very carefully. Uh, they're focused on health and safety. Uh, and they're also trying to find ways to innovate and reopen in ways that they can get some commercial activity going without uh, really putting themselves and, and their uh, customers at risk. So what we see this as, uh, as doing is really um, helping that effort and supporting them in that effort. Um, I'll take you through a couple of slides that summarize very quickly what the ordinance is uh, asking for. Um, you should know, though, as, as we go through this, that multiple groups have been involved in the due diligence on what we're proposing um, through the ordinance. Uh, the Plan Commission um, has been involved. The Board of Public Works has been involved. Planning and Transportation and, um, and city staff. Uh, across multiple departments have looked at this. And so we've, we've had a, a very intentional process and we intend to do this carefully. Um, and let me take you through very quickly what that looks like and then I, I'll answer any questions. And uh, Mike Rooker from uh, City Legal is also available uh, to, to answer questions. So basically the goals of easing the signage regulation program is uh, are number one to help uh, businesses communicate their safety protocols to potential customers and visitors during the reopening to remove barriers in the sign process during economically challenging times and to allow for a smooth transition back to whatever normal is going to be um, uh, and normal sign requirements when adju the adjustments expire um, so what we're proposing in signage is to suspend fees for temporary sign permits, which currently cost $75, and also for permanent sign permits, which cost $125. We uh, are asking to simplify and streamline the application and permitting processes for temporary sign permits, and then to relax certain restrictions on temporary signs and sandwich boards in the mixed-use downtown district. Um, from the perspective of the Kirkwood closure, which is uh, uh, tentatively scheduled with your approval to happen this weekend, what we're hoping to do is to help uh, the Kirkwood Association um, by, cl by closing portions of Kirkwood Avenue to pedestrian traffic to expand seating availability in the public right of way. So what this means is we are not um, enabling them to increase their uh, capacity we're allowing them to distribute that capacity across um, a broader spectrum, including the outside, which allows for uh, people to make, perhaps to feel more comfortable, and we'll be monitoring that very, quick, uh, very carefully. We are planning, uh, with your approval, to, to have the first test of this from June 19th, which is Friday, through the 21st, starting at around 5 o'clock on Friday. The closures are uh, tentatively scheduled to be allowed through September 30th. Um, that the KCA, which is the Kirkwood Association, would be allowed to submit a single application uh, for additional seating and merchandising encroachment. And that is about basically being able to have uh, tables and other encroachments on the sidewalk and on the in, in, in the parking spaces of the street. And then we would have the street uh, lanes become the new sidewalk. 
which would allow us to maintain ADA accessibility. Um, city staff would place bollards uh, to close the streets between Grant and Indiana, so two blocks, Grant and Dunn and Dunn and Indiana. We would put no parking <laughs> signage on blocks. We would communicate and have communicate with the food trucks so that they stay out of the area because the parking spots they usually use are those same spots that would be used for tables. And that we would put signage at both ends of the block to uh, redirect pedestrian traffic uh, both into the traffic lanes and the closed blocks and then back to the crosswalks at the end of the blocks to maintain maximum safety. Um, we are also on those signs, we're putting um, QR codes to get real time feedback from people and we'll be monitoring very closely what happens the first weekend and have a report back to you so that we can make a decision about whether or not we felt this would be something that would be worth continuing past the initial trial weekend. So that's a summary of it. Um, again, I'm Alex Crowley, Director of Economic Sustainable Development. Uh, that's my contact information and I'll uh, turn it back to you for questions. Thank you. Uh, before we go to questions, we'll hear a report from the Sustainable Development Committee, which heard this last week. Councilmember Scambaluri, would you like to report? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, first, begin with thanks to Mr. Crowley um, for the very good work done uh, by economic and sustainable development in moving this process forward. I think um, the summary was great, and I think the updates are going to be very helpful going forward, too. Um, I also want to thank the members of the Sustainable Development Committee, Council Members Bolin, Flaherty, and Sandberg, and myself. Uh, we met on Wednesday the 10th to hear more details and field questions um, on this particular proposal. Uh, no one, no members of the public spoke in opposition to the ordinance. Um, I do want to acknowledge the worship topic of downtown Bloomington, Mike McAfee of Visit Bloomington, and Mary Morgan of the Greater, Cham Greater Bloomington Chamber of <laughs> Commerce, uh, who offered their enthusiastic support for this pilot. Um, and I particularly want to acknowledge the Kirkwood Community Association as well um, for their work in putting this forward and finding ways that might help us thrive in the midst of pretty remarkable times. Um, with that, the committee is very supportive. We send it back to the council uh, with an invitation to support it and a recommendation of 400. Thank you. Thank you. All right, questions from members for either Mr. Crowley or the committee. I see Councilmember Rallo raise his hand first, then Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Crowley, am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was curious about um, between Grant and Indiana, is there, and I realize that this is a pilot, but of course there are restaurants between Wash Walnut and Washington. And I wondered, you know, was it, was it the idea that it was too onerous for traffic? There wasn't a, you know, it, it wasn't, it couldn't be accommodated for that reason or what, you know, why is it circumscribed to Grant from Grant to Indiana? So we, uh, we took the lead of the Kirkwood Community Association, and what they did as a process was to basically assign a uh, block captain for each block from uh, Walnut all the way through to Indiana. And the block captain basically um, was charged with determining whether or not there was enough critical mass of interest on their particular block to warrant a closure. Um, and there was, frankly, some contentions. There's some, some businesses wanted it, some did not. Um, it was determined that the, the blocks, these two blocks were the ones with the greatest amount of, um, of um, approval. And so we decided as a result of that to limit it to these initial blocks for this first trial. Um, we believe that there is a potential if it's successful and it helps, helps uh, the commercial activities that that could expand on Kirkwood and also per, you know, beyond that, potentially. Um, I should say that Kirkwood, um, and this is a tribute to the, to the work of Public Works, has done a, uh, you know, with the remodel of the Kirkwood or the, the, um, the work that was done there this summer, the ability to close Kirkwood is a lot easier than it is for other streets. And so it makes sense for us to limit the initial look to Kirkwood just for implementation and execution purposes, but it could expand beyond that. And we have to regroup and determine that uh, following the first weekend. I see. So this is on a trial basis, obviously, and, and we'll take, take stock and see how to proceed and 
after some period, some weeks, perhaps? Well, in fact, we're going to be, so we will be collecting real-time feedback from um, pedestrians and, and consumers during the weekend. So we have a QR code that goes into a, uh, you know, a survey, basically. Um, we'll also be issuing a, a very quick Monday morning survey to the merchants, both inside the closure and uh, adjacent to the closure, so we can understand what the feedback from them. And then in the first couple of days of next week, we'll want to make a decision based on that feedback and based on the assessment. We also will be monitoring from a city perspective, and uh, we're going to be asking the health department to do the same, to get all the feedback we can and make a, a decision about how was it, did it work? Is it worth continuing? And if so, then we can potentially expand the footprint if, if that's what the uh, uh, merchants would like. I see. W one, one other thing uh, briefly uh, is the fee suspension. Is, does that have any effect on, on revenue? I would assume it's probably very minimal. It's not a significant effect, but it is an effect. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Yes, um, I was interested in what you said, Mr. Crowley, about the, the fact that this does not, um, and I wanna make sure I understood it correctly. You said that this does not um, increase the capacity of the businesses, even though they'll have more space. Did I understand that right? Yeah, so one of the things we learned from the health department is, let's say that you are at 75% capacity and that's the rule that applies. Um, you are not allowed to expand your capacity by expanding outdoor space. Mm. So you have a set capacity uh, that is not allowed to be expanded as a result of having incremental, you know, sidewalk or, or footprints to be able to grow into. So we are um, essentially uh, the hypothesis here is that, that that people may or may not be comfortable going inside a restaurant, but they may be more comfortable going outside of a restaurant. Um, and so the allowance here is for is for flexibility in in locale, not flexibility in capacity. If that makes sense. Yes, and what are what is the capacity allowed currently? I believe it's seventy five percent. And that's for restaurants as well as retail stores. Uh, I believe that uh, the retail may be at a hundred percent capacity. Oh, yeah. Okay, that was that leads me to my next question, which was. Um, if you have a retail store and you have stuff, a merchandise on the sidewalk, how do you count your capacity at that point when people are just, you know, walking by or walking through your displays? But maybe that's not so important if it's a hundred percent anyway. This is uh, not a, a perfect science, but I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I would imagine that there's going to be probably a self uh, monitoring uh, among crowds perhaps and and then we'll just have to keep an eye you know but but if we're if we're watching what's going on which we intend to do we'll have a pretty good idea of of these types of problems that might exist that we're not totally anticipating so will the city have staff that are that will be out to see yeah. how it goes or yes we'll be out there um over the course of the weekend and then also uh we have a meeting tomorrow with the kirkwood association to their credit they are very focused on safety as well and so they you know they, they've been concerned about inadvertently creating a um, festival atmosphere and they don't want to do that. Uh, you know, there was talk early on of, hey, should there be bands out there? And, they, and that was quashed immediately. So I think the idea is let's try to keep this thing controllable. Let's make it successful. Let's allow it to potentially expand. And, um, and you know, I think it'll come down to whether or not, uh, it may not be immediately apparent in the first weekend what the commercial value of it is, but if it does continue, and if we do build it as a program and it goes through the currently proposed September 30th, we might be able to see some incremental benefit for uh, commerce downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Thank you, President Bolin. Uh, Mr. Crowley uh, is a great idea, and, and I'm think, thinking this is uh, gonna be a, a nice uh, reopening uh, to some extent for the mer merchants and hopefully really successful. Um, my question is, um, the bollards yeah, and the new street, some of the improvements to the street, uh, is that they will prevent any anyone from inadvertently 
turning a car down those roads that will now be um, made into pedestrian walkways? Yes, they've been set up, and I don't remember the exact count, but I think there are six across the intersections. So they are set up to do that. Uh, they're set up to be inserted and extracted easily. Um, our our, our uh, fire and police and EM, uh, EMS workers are, have been trained on, on, on that process. So if there's an, a need to get in there quickly, they can do that. Uh, they're, they're easily placed uh, by public works, so that makes it easier than closing another street. Um, and we will have signage on those bollards that allow for people to recognize they've come to the end of a protected walkway. We don't want them to cross the intersection in the middle of the street. We want them back onto the crosswalk. And so we'll have uh, uh, signage saying time to go back to this, essentially to the crosswalk when you cross the street. Great. Um, I'm happy uh, that all the safety concerns are, are addressed. And thank you very much. Thank you. Further questions from my colleagues on Ordinance 2011? If not, I have one question. Mr. Crowley, will Dunn Street continue to go through or will it be closed? Uh, in other words, will, will cars be able to continue to go through via Dunn Street? Yeah, all northwest, uh, north south um, access will be um, continuing. So, Dunn. And Grand and Indiana will both, will, all, all three of them will have North South. Very good. Thank you. Any further questions before we go to the public? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes. So, um, what happens if uh, we would like to extend the program beyond um, September 30th, either the signage component or the right of way component or, or both? Can I defer to uh, Mr. Rooker on that one? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to address that question. Michael Rooker, city attorney. Um, so we would go back to all three of the bodies that we had uh, discussed this with previously, the plan commission, the board of public works, and we would come yeah. back to the city council um, to discuss extending this if this is a program that we believe is successful and worthwhile to continue beyond September 30th. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, we'll go to the public for a comment on Ordinance 2011. If you are a member of the public who would like to address this ordinance, please raise your hand now and Mr. Lucas will call on you. I see one taker, Mr. Lucas. Mr. Alexander should be unmuted and ready to comment. Hi, uh, I'm Greg Alexander again. Um, I mean, this plan's awesome. Uh, I just, the last time uh, this council discussed um, closing Kirkwood to uh, cars, uh, it was brought up that other cities had tried closing their main streets to cars, um, like in the 70s and 80s, other cities in the US and in Indiana, and that they had had challenges. And I wanted to just give uh, a sh short little bit about the, the history of that. Um, that is true. They they tried that, and it was it was almost universally a failure in the U.S. And that's because the way that they did it is they did the same thing that the Bloomington did. Um, they they emptied out their core neighborhoods uh, because of the the rapid construction of of suburbs, and they uh, bulldozed about half of the commercial properties in their downtowns to build parking, which we did that too. And they also turned their uh, their main streets, um, in our case, College and Walnut they turned those into highways and we did that too. And so they kind of built a moat of parking and highways around downtown. And so then when you take your main street and you pedestrianize it, it, it it's kind of a catch 22, you know, that the, you're only happy there if you drove to get there because you have to cross uh, such a major highway in terms of College and Walnut to get there. And there's so much parking that there's less destinations for you, less diversity of destinations, especially. Uh, but then on the flip side, now you've banned cars on the on the main street. And so, of course, it didn't work. But um, the good news is that our downtown is filling up again with residences. Um, and in the last decade or two decades, uh, Kirkwood has really seen a lot of people have been digging up old uh, parking lots and turning them into um, businesses again and residences. 
And so we've seen a reversal of the mistakes that made it so impossible to pedestrianize Kirkwood. Uh, and we still have this problem of collagen walnut. Those are still highways. Um, and you see as, as close as like eight and walnut, you know, the it's switchyard, switchyard brewing right now, but we know Mars and Axis and Jake's, there were a whole series of, of businesses that failed in that location. It's because of walnut and college. Uh, pedestrian oriented businesses simply can't survive that close to college and walnut. And so we have this opportunity that if we fix college and walnut, everything else is lined up and we can re-pedestrianize our downtown. Um, so that's just something to think about because this really could be something that would be permanent, that would be successful over a long time span. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Next, Mr. Lucas. Next up is Mr. Jim Shelton, uh, should be unmuted and ready to go. Good evening again, uh, Council Jim Shelton. With speaking for the chamber at this time. Uh, we Obviously, we support this. Uh, we want to really appreciate uh, Mr. Crowley and the rest of the administration working with the business community in order to make this happen. We really, I think it's smart to do it as a, a, an experiment and see what works and what doesn't. So we encourage you to uh, approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Please speak up in the chat or raise hand. You use the Zoom function to raise your hand. Seeing no further public comment, we'll come back to the council for debate. Is there any final comment on ordinance 2011? Councilmember Scambaluri. Um, just one minor detail I want to acknowledge to you. In the report uh, submitted by this committee that came out in the packet, um, I don't believe Council Member Flaherty's electronic signature was included just because it came in a little later. Um, but I, could you confirm that, Council Member Flaherty, that you've added your signature since the uh, I did sign off in the report, yes. That might have come in too late today. My apologies. Great. Thank you. That's all I needed. Thank you. Any, any debate on Ordinance 2011? Council Member Rallo. Uh, Nothing to debate, just to credit uh, really the Department of Economic and Sustainable Development and uh, Mr. Crowley, his team. Um, I mean, clearly we've had challenges economically with the with the SARS-CoV-2, -CoV and um, we've stepped up in terms of assistance, and now we're stepping up in terms of adaptation. And I think uh, he, Mr. Crowley and his department deserve a lot of credit. Uh, for this and for implementing it. And I'm excited to see it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rallo. Please don't mistake debate for a rancor. It's simply a term of a term of uh, parliamentary art. Any further comments from council members? If not, I'll just say that uh, I have studied a couple of cities that did in fact try to create um, pedestrian streets, Iowa City and Charlottesville, both of them around the mid seventies tried to uh, block off several streets of their downtown shopping district from cars. And indeed they were uh, failures at least for a decade. Um, while whatever Mr. Alexander said is notwithstanding, uh, the problem was also that it was too much of a shock to the system because people were in fact still using cars. What we have right now is a situation where no one's using their car. And uh, this request to close came from the merchants of those streets themselves. It was not imposed upon them from above, but the city, I think, has been uh, very ready to accommodate them. It's an idea for an unusual set of reasons whose time seems to have come. Uh, I am looking forward to being there as masked as I, as unmasked as I can be while still keeping other people safe, but I'm looking forward to visiting Kirkwood this weekend to see uh, how people are received. Um, I do want to urge everyone to be careful when they go out. Uh, I know that my colleagues and I have seen a number of people who have decided that masks are no longer important. And, uh, you know, they, they are, they continue to be. Um, so, but with that, uh, I do hope that uh, Bloomington will support its uh, local businesses downtown this weekend. This experiment is very important. Um, I wanna thank the committee for its work. I wanna thank uh, Economic and Sustainable Development and I wish the merchants luck and I, will, I hope to see you all downtown 
this weekend. Uh, is there any other comment? If not, I will call for a vote. Will the clerk please call the roll on Ordinance 2011? Councilmember Scandalary? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. Uh, by 9-0 vote, Ordinance 2011 is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Go now to the next item. Madam Parliamentarian. Mr. President, I move that Resolution 2009 be read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please call the roll of the motion to introduce and read by title and synopsis? Councilmember Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rolo? Yes. Scambillery? Yes. All right, uh, we have, uh, that's adopted. Will the clerk please read by title and synopsis? Resolution 2009, authorizing the allocation of the Jack Hopkins Social Services Program funds for the year 2020 and related matters. The synopsis is, this resolution brings forward the recommendations of the 2020 Jack Hopkins Social Services Funding Program Committee. The principal task of the committee is to recommend funding for local social services agency proposals that best meet program criteria and best meet the needs of the community. This resolution allocates a total of $319,795 to 24 different agency programs. The resolution also approves the funding agreements with these agencies, accepts the report of the committee, authorizes the chair of the committee to resolve any questions regarding the interpretation of the agreements, and adjusts the committee membership to include four members from the council assigned by the president of the council and three city residents appointed by the committee chair with experience in social services. Thank you. I move that resolution 2009 be adopted. Second. All right, I think here to present would be council member and chair of the Jack Hopkins Social Services Funding Committee, Susan Sandberg. Uh, council member Sandberg, would you please go ahead? Yes, proudly, this is the 28th year for the Jack Hopkins Social Services Fund. And um, we are very proud to be able to allocate the, um, my records say $318,795 that was distributed, uh, distributed among 24 outstanding agencies um, and um, programs that support uh, individuals in our community uh, that are in low-income categories. This was definitely a COVID-19 driven focus uh, as we worked very collaboratively with Beverly Callender Anderson and her social services work group who had been diligently taking a look at the most pressing community need as a result of the uh, COVID crisis. And so the members of the committee, uh, let me just introduce them briefly. Uh, they are Matt Flaherty, Ron Smith, Sue Scambaluri and myself as chair, and then we were joined by two community members, Tim Mayer and Mark Fraley. Uh, one of the recommendations that will be coming forward from this, the, this committee is that in next year's round, we actually add one more to the committee, and that would be a community member, as opposed to the traditional five council members and two community members. So again, that's for your consideration as of tonight's report. Um, a lot of information is already in your pocket, the resolution itself, and a very comprehensive report that walks you through the process. This is a very time-consuming and a uh, long process that was made even more complicated by the fact that we had to conduct all the meetings um, virtually. We did not have that same ability to do uh, the public round of, of hearings um, as the agencies came forward to make their presentations in addition to the 
uh, the grants that all of us on the committee read through and um, used as the basis for our considerations this year. Um, I clearly want to thank our staff, Stephen Lucas, Dan Sherman, and Becky Bustani. Um, as the public probably knows, I hope you know, uh, council members are not full-time staff. We, many of us, if not the majority of us, have full-time jobs in addition to our work on council. And the amount of work, the preparation, the transparency, the, the, the careful um, uh, administration of this particular grant program does require a lot of assistance from our, from our very outstanding staff. And we had new members of the staff who had not done this before, as well as um, we're going to be welcoming uh, from the HAND staff. And of course, now that the recommendations are coming forward in this body will hopefully approve them tonight, the hand staff will then work with the agencies in uh, executing their um, this grant and uh, making sure everything is going well. And we'll have a new member of the hand staff joining that team, and that's Cody Toothman, uh, who joined Dora Sims and Eric Sater in sitting in on our meetings and, and guiding us through uh, much of the deliberations. This is a smooth running machine, having been in operation since 1993. There have been some significant changes made over the years and most recent years, we are uh, recognizing that many social service agencies have a growing need for operational funds. And so we have become a lot more flexible in granting some of that at the request of the agencies themselves. We do carefully survey them at the end of each round to get feedback uh, on what their, what their needs are in serving low-income um, individuals in this community. Jack Hopkins has always prioritized food, shelter, and health care. And that was primarily the theme this year, again, in addressing the emergent needs from the COVID crisis. And so I will say um, kudos to this committee. Um, they did an outstanding job of allocating the dollars in a way that uh, the agencies will benefit and be able to do some significant things with the dollars that we've had available. Um, so I believe that is it for just a brief summary and happy to answer any questions if we have any, but hopefully you have read through the allocations. They are in your packet as to the 24 agencies that were granted and for what uh, their uh, requests were granted for. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. With that, I'll open the floor to questions from members. Is there anyone who has a question about Resolution 2009? Going once, going twice. We'll go now to the public. If there's a member of the public who'd like to speak on Resolution 2009, please raise your hand in Zoom or type into the chat. Mr. Lucas will call on you. Is there anyone who would like to speak to resolution 2009? I see one hand, Mr. Lucas. I see Carol Canfield, who should be unmuted and ready to comment. Ms. Canfield, you'll have five minutes. Go ahead. Yes, I would just like to, excuse me, I got to turn the speaker off. Um, I would just like to voice my objection to Planned Parenthood and all options receiving funds. Um, this is not an old argument that I have made. Uh, it's one I've posted for many years, but particularly with Planned Parenthood this year, um, when they refused to stop doing their abortions at a time when non-emergency and non-necessary surgeries were asked to be halted and they continued to do them. Um, this is just not acceptable. And they are also now being supported by Planned Parenthood of Northwest, um, the Northwest region, including um, um, Hawaii and I, I can't remember the proper name of it. I'm sorry, um, but in of the Northwest Planned Parenthood region, uh, they're being supported with by them now. They don't need these funds from us. And I would just ask that either uh, you, you vote this down or to isolate them so that they can be voted on separately. And as far as the uh, all options goes, uh, it's basically a front for referring abortions and uh, for supporting the Hoosier Abortion Fund, which they started. There are other groups in town which provide diapers. 
not that diapers aren't needed and can be used you know from any source they get them but that's not the main focus thank you thank you is there any further public comment on resolution 2009 mr lucas um uh this is Andrew. I, I've got uh, Chris Connell here, uh, Mr. Lucas, that has private messaged me. So, uh, if they sure, um, I believe Mr. Connell is now unmuted and ready to comment. Hi, oh, yes, yeah, so I'd like. Connell, to... Please go ahead. You'll have five minutes. Thanks. I'd just like to uh, second what uh, Mrs. Canfield has said here and uh, point out that. Yeah, they, they receive uh, just Indiana and Kentucky alone, Planned Parenthood, which we all know, I hope, uh, is really the main provider of abortions in the U.S., and it's really, that is the primary function here. I mean, there's other services they offer, but they're not unique to those services. Uh, they, they took in like $19 million, just that part of Planned Parenthood. You know, the, they're part of a greater organization that I think uh, uh, Mrs. Canfield was speaking of that took in $58 million in 2018. Uh, they don't need this local support, and it's extremely partisan, you know, and from our point of view, from my point of view, they're killing babies, and this is a really evil thing. Many people agree with me. There's a, maybe a majority uh, feel this way and believe this way. Uh, I think, you know, technically, when the face of it, it's clear that it is that, obviously, um, but whether you agree with it or not, uh, this is not a local, local organization. I would highly recommend there's so many good causes that can be uh, the recipients of this money that are truly local and reaching the poor and doing actual good service to poor developing businesses and uh, really improving the lives of many of the people in our community directly. I, I highly just uh, hope and that you will consider not funding them this year taking them off the list, um, or at least isolating them for a separate vote, as Mrs. Canfield said. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Mr. Lucas? Not that I see, and I don't know if anybody else has uh, requested a... Last call, if you'd like to make comment on Resolution 2009, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, or type into the chat to Mr. Krebs or Mr. Lucas. Going once, going twice, and the public comment period has ended. We'll come back now for debate to the council. Are there any final comment on resolution 2009? Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I just want to add my appreciation to uh, the Jack Hopkins Social Services mm -hmm. Committee and um, the, uh, this, as, as Council Member Sandberg said, this is tedious, it was long, um, and it wasn't easy. Um, and there's always a greater need um, throughout the community, um, even with the, the, the organizations that have been funded. Um, so I just want to uh, thank the committee for their hard work. Um, it's just one of the programs that or throughout the community that helps a very vulnerable community. And I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further comment from members? Council Member Scambaluri, and then Council Member Piedmont Smith. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to serve on, on this group uh, and participate in these recommendations. Um, as perhaps other council members have too, I've received a number of messages in the last few days opposing funding um, for Planned Parenthood and for all options. And I want to take a minute and acknowledge those um, and let them know that those, those arguments are, are heard. Um, they fell into two categories. As I, I went back and looked at all the messages earlier today, um, one very valid concern and was the notion that any funding from Jack Hopkins would be commingled with other funds that would provide abortion services. Um, I'm a fundraiser by trade, many of you know that. I care deeply about donor intent when it's a gift and I care deeply about the use of these grants. Um, so I actually spent time on the phone with Planned Parenthood and with all options yesterday asking about their accounting and their audit procedures and the independent audits that happen of their funds 
Um, and I am satisfied that these funds are not used to provide abortion services. Some of the messages are that it's fungible, um, but I want people to know that this committee has thought about that and, and has put in place questions and processes to ensure that these funds are kept separate. Um, the second major category of objections I heard um, suggested that even though this particular grant was for colposcopy equipment, that essentially tests for HPV, the human papilloma virus, and infection with that is tied to bad behavior. Basically, this was the argument we need. Um, and I will lead to others' judgment around that particular issue. Uh, but the argument was that Planned Parenthood is essentially encouraging bad behavior by providing services related to this. And the logic of that, to be very honest, uh, respectfully fell apart for me. That seems akin to faulting an oncologist who treats people with lung cancer and saying that that doctor is encouraging smoking um, by virtue of treating lung cancer. But so that analogy and that train of logic didn't resonate with me. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that those are deeply held feelings um, and that feedback is important. And I encourage uh, in all the messages I responded to, I encourage people to consider applying to be a citizen participant in the Jack Hopkins Committee next year, and I provided links to that. Um, this is a public process, um, and I invite you to consider that. So those are the comments I offer. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Yes, um, I'd also like to thank the committee uh, very much. I know this is a time-intensive process, and it's very difficult to um, allocate insufficient funds when there is so much need in the community. Um, I do want to ask my council colleagues as we go into um, future uh, years of the Jack Hopkins Social Funding Committee to consider um, having at least one person of color on the committee. Uh, the committee many years is, is all white, um, and I think it would be a, a good added perspective to have a person of color or a person of an ethnic minority group to join the committee. Um, so I just encourage us to consider that next year and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Further comment from council members? Looking at both screens. Councilmember Sandberg, then Councilmember Smith. Councilmember Smith can go first. All right, she will uh, defer to Councilmember Smith. Uh, I just wanted to say it was an honor to be on the Jack Hopkins committee. It was really uh, challenging to allocate the funds. And I want to thank the city staff and uh, the chair, uh, Susan Sandberg, who did a fantastic job uh, keeping herding cats, keeping us all kind of in, going in the right direction. And that's why I got into public service was to do good things. So I, it made me feel good to participate. So thank you very much. And uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. Um, th this year was the largest amount of requests that we've ever had. And uh, what made the committee uh, decision so difficult this year is we had to, um, um, first round, we had to eliminate our uh, agencies that would not even be heard, would not even be considered. And then uh, those that we did consider, we had to cut it in half in order to fit the amount of dollars that we have available. Now, Social Services Fund here at the City of Bloomington is a real source of pride because not all cities designate this kind of, they don't earmark this kind of uh, money for social services. So we've been ahead of this curve since 1993. Um, and that is something the City of Bloomington can be proud of. Um, the other thing is, this is a very strong community for social services. Now, social services are under tremendous strain right now because they're not able to conduct their fundraising activities in ways they normally can. Their major events, their signature events had to be canceled. They're having to appeal to people online. And that is having a significant impact on a lot of our social services agencies, which is why these funds are more important than ever. Uh, this combined with the CDBG dollars, and uh, we did have some additional funding this year 
uh, that, that uh, came about because of the COVID crisis that again, the hand department is overseeing. But um, this committee did have a, a big lift uh, and the decisions they made were not um, uh, unwise in terms of keeping the priorities in front of us as to uh, what was needed. And so I feel very comfortable in the recommendations that you see before you. And uh, I hope the rest of the council will see your way to approve them. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Any final, final comments from other members who have not yet spoken? Councilmember Flaherty. Uh, yes, I'll keep it brief. I echo many of the sentiments my colleagues already shared. I just wanted to express my uh, thanks to Chair Sandberg for uh, chairing the committee this year um, and um, express that it was a pleasure to take part in that process and acknowledge that, yes, it was a very difficult uh, decision allocating these funds among groups, uh, but I feel very confident in the um, final recommendations we came up with. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sandberg. If I could just make one last comment, because I absolutely agree with Councilmember Piedmont Smith's comment about diversity, and that was something that we considered. There was a little instability. We weren't sure who that, that, that last member of the committee was going to be. As chair, I picked this year some experience. That kind of was the diversity I was looking for, given that there were so many newcomers to the process this year. But next year, if you will accept our recommendation to add that third community member, you can absolutely guarantee that um, the committee will be extremely mindful of, of adding uh, diverse members of the community who also have experience and, um, and um, knowledge about local nonprofit organizations. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just say uh, in conclusion that I've never done the task of the house. It's difficult every year. I am grateful for the vision that uh, our, our predecessors had uh, almost 30 years ago in creating this fund, uh, which I'm happy to say has been nurtured by every council since. And uh, I think that we're filling. Uh, even though we really can't do enough to help uh, these not-for-profits uh, provide the crucial services they provide to our community. With that, uh, I will accept a motion. Actually, there's no need to. I'm just. I can call the question. Call the roll on resolution 2009. Council Member Sims? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Skimbleri? Yes. And Rosenbarger? Yes. By 9 0 vote, resolution 2009 is adopted. Thank you to everyone. We will now go to additional public comment. If there is someone who has not yet spoken this evening on a matter that was not on the agenda, here is a second opportunity for you to make public comment. If you would like to do so, please raise your hand in Zoom or type into the Zoom chat. Is there anyone who would like to speak to items that are have not were not on tonight's agenda? and who has not already spoken. Seeing none, we'll go to matters of the council schedule. Who will take this, Mr. Sherman or Mr. Lucas? I can jump in. Uh, there aren't, uh, aren't many uh, items for your consideration. Just a few reminders that uh, after tonight's meeting, uh, the council does begin its annual summer recess. Um, it's not actually that long. Uh, the council will pick up its first legislative cycle in July with a work, ses uh, work session on July the 10th. Uh, the first uh, regular session of the council will be July 22nd. And as noted earlier in this meeting, uh, there are uh, standing committees that, that may meet over recess. Uh, one such committee meeting is happening tomorrow. Uh, that's a meeting of the council's public safety committee as opposed to the uh, Board of Public Safety, which will um, uh, have to reschedule their meeting from yesterday. So um, that meeting of the Council Standing Committee will take place tomorrow at 7 p.m. over Zoom. And um, those are all of the reminders. Thank you. 
if there are, are there any other uh, announcements or closing comments? Uh, you're all frozen, so I don't know if you can even hear me. But uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor, please just say aye. 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 All right. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Uh, it's been a hell of a first half of the year. We'll see you in July. Please have a good recess and stay safe.